Previously on Is This Thing On, 10 very different people from very diverse backgrounds gathered at Imperial Hotel in Melbourne's Chapel Street for day one of their six day intensive course to become stand up comedians. Happily married, I'm in a same sex marriage. My wife and I have been having the same fucking sex for 22 <laughs> years. Each student was asked to present two minutes of original material that was dissected and critiqued by guest comedian Brad Oaks. You should remind yourselves always to go out and enjoy yourself. Doesn't matter how shit scared you are. Brad then took the class on their first excursion to a local comedy venue for an open mic tryout night. I'm from Geelong. Quite proud to be from Geelong actually uh, because we are number one in Australia for chlamydia. So. <laughs> It's now day two, and the bleary-eyed students are back in class. Their first task was to reflect on last night's performances. Some of the guys are actually really pretty good, but there were a couple that were really bad, and I thought, how am I going to be at the end of the week? <laughs> the great thing about doing comedy is there's always someone who you're going to see, you can say, well, actually, I'm probably as good as, if not a bit better, or, there's always someone to aspire to. I loved how diverse it was. Like, there was every age bracket, every style of comedy, but not just on stage in the crowd as well. You know, it was technically homework, not just for enjoyment, so it was interesting to see body language, crowd work, experience, stories. So I liked that. Yeah, it was good because there was a few taboo topics that were on there and it was good to see the reaction of the crowd to those topics. There was one guy in particular that spoke about um, sleeping with his auntie. It was more in reference to him also sleeping with his dad and his mum. How did that go down? Not well. No. Oh, to be honest, it came across just a little bit too real for me, actually, what he was saying. <laughs> Boy, I mean, I'll be saying what everyone's saying. I mean, you know, he was a shy, quiet guy, you know, and he just sort of like, you sure you're only joking about yeah. that? You know, I slept with my dad, I, you know, so I didn't. The thing okay. that creeped me out last yeah. night was old men talking about masturbating a lot. It was like thinking of your parents having sex the way it was as... Sometimes less. Do you do that often? Yeah, we think of your parents. Well, well we weren't, we weren't until now. <laughs> I feel like this is a group therapy session for sex offenders <laughs> right now. Not a comedy. I kind of feel like that's what comedy is. Yeah. <laughs> One comedian completely ripped off someone else's joke. Oh, well, that's a no-no. Many, many comics have been guilty of it, myself included. When I first started, I just borrowed a couple of jokes. It's okay to adapt material, make it your own. And if you do use someone's joke and you give the person credit, then I think it's perfectly fine because you can still get the laugh as long as you say, Brad Oaks, thank you, Brad, for that joke, or whatever, where you give credit where credit is due. It was a very mixed bag last night. I felt some of them bombed pretty hard. And, and when there was a few in a row that I that didn't work for me, um, yeah, I just kind of drifted off. Yeah, I see you nodding, Steve. Did you feel the same? Yeah, I felt the same, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, as in, like, there was a few that were... I felt like we're going a little bit too long. This whole thing about effectively dying on stage is to do with this ability to clock what's going on. This train that I'm on is not the right train. Every station's the wrong station, right? So I'm gonna get on a different train. So you change your tack. I think like the difference between Brad and then all the other performers is obviously experience, right? So the, the, the normal performers, They've got their five minutes, and for the last day or so, they've been going, yep, this is the five minutes that I'm going to do, blah, 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 blah. Whereas, obviously, with Brad, they've got 30 years of stuff, so they can read a crowd and say, yep, okay, this isn't working, I can jump on another train. And that's why they're significantly better, and then the newbies are, I've got this five minutes, I'm doing This tonight. is all I've got, this is the only train I've got. I think comedy is a personal thing, and I think for me personally, when I'm talking about something, it's based on my experience or something that I'm very knowledgeable about and I think knowledge is usually based with experience. And I think that when you are on a stage on a platform in front of a group of people, you shouldn't be talking about something that you can't back up, not just with you know a certain amount of evidence, but not just having an out there opinion or something you've read on a platform of social media or something like that. Brad's decision to take the class to see other new comedians had stimulated healthy discussion. Suddenly, everyone was an expert. But it had also shone a spotlight on just how daunting stand-up comedy could be. And Glyn knew that for the students to have any hope of success, they needed to create material that was personal to them.
yesterday hit aside the homework of speaking about themselves, three topics, their background, their family and their appearance. It was now time to present. I was a very smart child too. I remember finding a bowl with something in it and saying to my parents, what's that? And they said, it's, oh, Cara, it's just um, it's guinea pig food. And I said, well, why the fuck do you smoke it? And when the fuck did we get a guinea pig? <laughs> because I hear what people think when I walk on stage. Fitness trainer. <laughs> oh, okay. I was raised by my mum and my grandma. We lived in one apartment together. Uh, I like to refer to us as the skinny, flat-ass, no-lip-broke version of the Kardashians. Obviously, my name's Judy Stutz. I have a cousin called Judith Stutz as well. Now, that worked out OK, except at Melbourne Uni, because we graduated at the same time, I ended up getting invited to the medical degree and she was very upset because she ended up as a barista. <laughs> so. You all know my name is Grant. To be honest, it's a really boring name. Now, Steve here said, uh, you know, do you prefer Grant or Grant? To be really honest, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> my parents came here from Vietnam. My dad actually built the raft that took my family to this country, which is crazy because Jetstar just had a two-for-one sale last week. <laughs> <laughs> I lost two cousins in that raft. I was reading this uh, headline, it was like an article that said 70 is the new 30. And I got a little bit pissed off because, uh, you know, I only just heard 30 myself. You know, this it, is bullshit. I'm not, this is my decade, you know, I just come to the terms of, uh, you know, I'm losing my youth and I'm losing my hair and now I have to deal with this shit that you 7 year olds trying to take in my decade. This is, no, we're not taking us 30 year olds, we're not going to deal with this shit anymore. You know, so when does it ever end? Because 6 is a new 20, 40 is a new 10, what's 30? 30 is a new baby? <laughs> wow! <laughs> 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 It was only the second time they had taken the stage, and for some, it was apparent they were growing in confidence. But for others, it seemed to be having a negative effect. I've lost my train of thought. Uh, okay. But if you uh... just go, just go back yep. to what's the? Do, we, do you have a link between the uh, shades of grey? So I got a hair transplant. But um, it would have been nice if they can could have took the hair from my back instead and put it there. Then they could have killed, killed two birds with, birds with one stone. <laughs> Even Kim de Cruz, who had seemed so confident from the beginning, was starting to show signs of the mounting pressure. We had a meltdown this morning. I just yesterday when I um, yesterday morning I got off stage and um, with our first performance and it didn't go so well for me and it didn't feel good and then Glenn said that um, perhaps I should come up with all new material which really caught me off guard and it played on me all day everything is just built up on me and I'm so freaking myself out, which is what I do, I self-sabotage, because now I feel the pressure of actually having to rewrite everything again and it's, yeah, it's, it's challenging. It's really fucking challenging. Meanwhile, our behavioural analyst, Steve Van Apron, had taken Stacey and Brad aside in an effort to help them overcome the challenges they were facing. What is it that you think is inhibiting your ability to recall? Because my head gets really muddled, I have lots and lots of ideas going on all the time, which has been quite typical, it's how do I present things in a logical way. Mnemonics work really well. Um, so one of them is be suave. It's almost like saying, you know what, when I play golf, I don't want to hit the ball into the water. What inevitably happens? You hit it into the water. Correct. So we program ourselves. So if you can program yourself to do one thing, we can undo that program. The second is chunky. Now, what I mean by chunky, it is harder to remember huge slabs of information than what it is when you break it down into its components. I want you to visualise for a moment, as you walk in through your front door, Tell me what you see. Uh, I see the, the, the front um, table. Mm -hmm. You know, walk into the kitchen, there's the, the bench, the TV. Okay. Now, see how you can recall that? Yes. Very easily. Why? Because it's part of your life. Let's just say, you've got a couple of ideas for uh, some jokes, but you're having problems recalling them. Hook them or connect them to some visual um, expression so that way they're easier to recall. So, the two things I want you to focus on is come up with in your mind, eat, and secondly, chunk. 
so with a mnemonic, is that so, say, say you've got five jokes, that you come up with a word that represents those? Absolutely. Try it, and I think you'll notice a world of difference. OK, that's a great advice. I think it was just because I had spent, I've just spent four weeks perfecting what I had done, and I'd gotten a really good response from it and I thought I was I thought I'd made it like I thought I'd finally had something worthy of being so proud of and then I just didn't get what I was expecting so it kind of just it took me back a little bit you know and I put so much pressure on myself ah can we can I have a second at the same time, Glenn was working one-on-one -on -one with the rest of the students, helping to refine their material. I like that. Because we can go, I can go through so many iterations, which would explain why it would go to now. And in the end, when the raft was ready, Mum said, why don't we just go jet start? <laughs> your problem is not your content. Your problem is not your structure. Your problem is up here. It's preventing you from being the best comedian that you can be. Now, when you're talking to somebody, do you normally look down? No. Why do you do it on stage? Yeah. Um. I find it actually quite funny that when you survive a serious operation, everyone actually sits there and tells you how lucky you are. Mm. You know, obviously people have got a very different opinion to me because my idea of lucky is actually sort of getting through customs with a kilo of cocaine strapped to your body, mm. you know. <laughs> Stop this negative self-talk. Like I said on the first day, what happens is when your brain is engaged in all this negative self-talk, then all of a sudden your brain starts thinking that that's the case. So I want you to get up on stage, I want you to own that stage, right. because you are funny. Okay. Well, Other people are laughing at you. If you stood up there and no one was laughing, yeah. then you would have a reason to think you're not funny. Yeah. But that's not the case. Yeah. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Sure. I want you to really practice on enjoying yourself yeah. and owning that stage. Maybe I can start, you know, at the beginning like, you know, now I've started worrying about ageing and then I can say, let me give you a random example. And then you look in the mirror and say, but it's OK, it's not me. Mm. Or something like yes, that. Yes, that's not a bad idea. You know, this was a huge thing for me to do this again. I was so excited, I was so happy. I, I had a, a, I probably put too much expectation on myself, thinking that it was going to work. Um, but, it, yeah, I just, I didn't get the response that I thought I was going to get, that I, you know, that, that future planning kind of feeling, the achievement of, you know, making, doing something good. And then we can even look at you going into free fall. We can physicalise that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the air, we can add to that. So what you're doing, you're just, it's the same story, but we're just adding to it with some physical stuff. What I love about your material is that it is absurdist. So I would say, give us time to catch up with you. You know, when I was little, I had invisible friends. Give them names, you know, and genders. Give them real personas that this is the ridiculous nature of it. And then we're with you more, you know. I met them when I was seven. Sally had buck teeth, and then she had them straightened when she was 17. She was still invisible, but, gee, she looked better, you know. <laughs> well, I guess you can still construct drug paraphernalia on a pension when you're old. I mean, what well, nana doesn't want to make a bomb? Yeah. <laughs> I know I will when yeah. I'm a nana. So, yeah, PE class was jumping fences and running from cops. Yes. Um, we didn't cut school, we cut meth. OK. And my favourite class was functional organisational structure for optimum wealth. Basically, it meant don't smoke what you sell. So I want you to stand up now. OK. And I want you to put your arms up. Yep. And I want you to tell me how funny you are. Yeah, I'm incredible. Look at me and I'm, tell me. All right, I'm incredibly funny. I've got yes, lots of funny things to say. Um, and I, why are and, you so funny? Uh, because I'm a Look at me. <laughs> because I'm a shit stirrer. Yep. I like to push boundaries yep. and I like to upset people a little bit and, uh, and, and play with people. Perfect. Yep. Perfect indeed. And with everyone finding new confidence, honing material, and learning how to remember jokes, it was time to introduce today's guest comedian, Japanese stand-up Mayumi Nabetsu. I really don't want to take a stance of teach you, you know, but uh, this is my seventh year um, doing a comedy. We should pay a respect and put our hands together for this. Put your hands together. Loud and clear so that I can understand. 
understand you. As a performer, the worst thing is like the nervous feeling. <coughs> it's coming from, if I forget, what should I do? People might be laughing at, how dare me? I'm too old for this. I'm not looking at it, it's just like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of baggage coming, you know, like around you in your brains, and I think the best thing is to just get rid of it. Just take all those baggage out, you know. Just try to be as natural as possible. But many people say, be yourself. When you start to read um, textbooks to be, you know, comedians, you have to be yourself. I have a little bit of um, objection or different feeling about be yourself because if you ask me, Mayumi, please be yourself, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> this is really be myself if I really want to be myself. So you're taking from that you're an introvert? <laughs> I observed from a lot of professional people before they start, they walk from the back of the stage to the end, to the end, to observe what kind of audience they have on the day. And they, they share the viewpoint that audience is like a one living organ, organism, like a, one living big person. So they spot those things and they, they try to react to the organism in front of you. So you really need to focus on the audience. What kind of organism am I dealing with today? At the same time, don't get overwhelmed. You also have to be feel comfortable. If in some negative vibe coming up to you, you just have to try to be comfortable with it. Another important thing that I want to share is um, you have to be heard. So if somebody is very noisy, shut that kind of thing yes. down as well. So I want you to take off all those worries up and kind of strip the mind and to be pure, as comfortable as a, like a little babies, and take a look at the organism in front of you. Focus, try to communicate and enjoy the moment. That's very, very important. You have to enjoy the moment of a communication. So I'm going to take you to the excursion and you're going to learn further about you getting rid of all those worries and be comfortable on the stage. Mayumi Nabitsu first became obsessed with comedy as a teenager and has spent a lifetime perfecting her craft, performing in New York, Kuala Lumpur and for the last seven years, Melbourne. In the mid-90s, she worked with Monty Python's Michael Palin on his travel documentary, Full Circle. So it's little wonder that the outing she has planned for the students is a little absurdist, to say the least. All right, so you just position yourself behind an easel. You, you can choose anywhere you like. Yeah, I'll always like it, I'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember, you know, to focus the audience as like a one organism? Well, we want to do this just try to draw the naked body, okay. the real human, as an organism. So I brought my model, um, which is my son. <laughs> Try to be a little bit homey, so um, hopefully. Mason, come here. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. 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 ネキ、ネキってボディ。下に行ってないじゃん。でも、ちょっと。ネキ、ネキ、ネキ、ネキ、ネキ。ネキ、ネキ、ネキ、ネキ。ネキ、ネキ、ネキ、ネキ。ネ
Don't don't follow others. That's your decision. <laughs> as, as a performer, this is what I'm gonna focus on. Yeah, I think I, I'm an artist, but maybe not in that way. <laughs> I think I had too much distraction around me. Yeah, <laughs> to you have a lot of <laughs> no, maybe maybe this is not fair enough. So. Why don't we just all take the clothes off and then feel comfortable like a baby, as I told you. Remember, just take off all those baggages out of you and just take it off. Yes, please take it off, everybody. Let's take the clothes off. Come on, take off. Take off, everybody. I follow. OK, everybody, please take off. Ah, Ah, jeez. I'll take my coat off. Yeah, okay, take off your clothes. I remember don't take shoes. I there we so go. No, don't take your shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Australian room, everybody. Don't take the shoes off. And then the teacher starts tripping down. It was just like, wow, very confronting. And next minute I look around and all the guys are getting their gear off and there's bottoms hanging everywhere. Everyone can see what's going now. Yes, it's real. I'll stop there. Yeah, it's a little bit chilly, isn't it? Yeah, it's moving. Let's move it. Oh, let's yeah. move it. And you said you weren't going to do it. Oh, no. Well done. How do you feel? Don't care, right? No. Just don't care. <laughs> oh, she's joining us. Yes, oh. Oh. Yeah. One by one, the students embrace Mayumi's notion to disrobe to varying degrees of nudity, and gradually the entire class began to relax and focus on the job at hand. So you feel a bit awkward, right? That's how you feel on the stage, but let it go with the flow. And you focus on the butt and organism in front of you, so it's going to be easy for you, OK? Just focus. That's pretty much the worst thing for me, is just doing that. As far as very uncomfortable. Well, it can't get much worse, could it? <laughs> and draw the buttocks. Think about the head. That's your piece of a comedy. All right, enjoy. I mean, it, it was really lovely because you, you pass judgment and you say, well, no one's going to do this. And I love that the first people who are actually keen to do it were the last people that I ever expected, which just goes to show you can never judge a book by its cover. And it was a really, really enjoyable thing to be a part of. Just, just, we're, we're, to your clothes, dear. Oh, what dear. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, Snacky, you're the only person who painted in yellow that makes you the racist in the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Saw all the blokes taking off the gear, and I thought, well, I'm not gonna bloody be outbraved by a bunch of blokes. So <laughs> decided, sod it, <laughs> and joined in. Um, I think uh, what it's done is removed a lot of the fear factor. What's the worst that could happen? So I think that's the takeaway message for stand up comedy is worst case scenario, you bomb. Big deal. You know, it's not going to end your life. <laughs> like after that first transition to nudity, very quickly the focus was just on the model, and I was just in that zone, and uh, I thought that was good because on day one I wasn't focused on the audience, and today that's all I was focused on. So uh, do you have a feel of you know like? Look at the audience as one big organism and you're focusing on the butt. You know, sometimes you have a two heads, two arms. If that's one concept of dealing with it and focusing and having fun. Yeah. Feel the organism. Feel the organism. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is like the funniest moment. Right. Yes, yes, that's right. A lot of jokes are coming here. What a day. <laughs> I uh, have gotten through the day and I feel very positive. I've been able to write some new material today, which has given me a great feeling. And I knew, I, I just, I do it to myself all the time. I go, oh, wow. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm like, nope, stop being a sook. And, uh, and I, I, I come out the other end and I'm always more positive. You know, to get nude in front of new people that you've only just met is very confronting. Um, you know, it's like comedy as well, to stand up on, and perform on a stage in front of new people is probably just as daunting. I actually have to say that it's really the same feeling. Maybe I might do that together. That could be my next challenge. If you feel nervous or some audience giving you a hard time, just remember my butt and my son's butt. <laughs> I don't know if it takes 
from my mo his mom. But <laughs> the chat I had with Steve this morning was just amazing in terms of what was holding me back from being confident. He connected with me in a really profound way. He really got into my head and it's like, pfft, you know, and made me, yeah, I don't know. I feel much more confident after that chat with him and I, I feel really excited about the next time I get to go on stage, so. <laughs> I mean, they just painted my butt, so <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't think they can get any closer <laughs> unless they just painted my testicles. <laughs> I, I, I never thought that would ever happen in my life. Uh, now it has, and now I have to explain that to my wife, uh, which is kind of weird, but uh, you know, I could also brag about this to my buddies at work. <laughs> Based on the discussion with Steve, it was kind of like, um, what do you do when you feel uncomfortable? And then, you know, once you're in there, you just kind of jump out and just, just do it, I guess. What do you think? It's the biggest thing that holds you back. Growing up, we very rarely got compliments. You know, we never, it was no, there was no positive reinforcement growing up. So yeah. it was really like, if you're doing this, why aren't you doing this, yeah. you know? So then uh, when you compliment me, I, I can hear what you say and appreciate it, but I, it doesn't resonate. I think it's important to note that you're not always going to please everybody all of the time. But when it comes to self-validation, you need to look at how the people in the room are reacting to you, and they're reacting really well. Yeah. You're putting so much pressure on yourself, and you don't need to. So what I want to instill is, A, stop the negative self-thoughts. They're, they're not going to help anyone. Any time you hear yourself saying something negative, I want you to, I don't care what it is, sometimes what I do is I put on music, full ball, um, Led Zeppelin, whatever your, your thing is, but yeah. it's amazing how quickly a thought process can change. Secondly, believe in yourself. I, I don't think you have problems coming up with the material, delivering it or writing. Some people are like so stressed, as you've seen, they're holding onto the microphone, like, yeah. you own that stage. What more do you need? <laughs> Thanks, Good on you. <laughs> told me that, you know, I, I shouldn't be so hard on myself, um, you know, just trying to break down all those barriers that I'm, all these walls that I'm building in my own mind. And, um, you know, just back yourself. I think that was the, the main thing. There was probably like a slight five seconds towards the end where I forgot my pants were off and then the cold breeze reminded me that my pants were off. Everyone else was a lot more relaxed than I was. Um, hence why I was the last one. Um, I, yeah, I kept thinking of my mum. She used to tell me before I'd leave the house, you need to bend over and if I could see anything, you're not wearing that out of the house. And then I'm like, oh, she's gonna be really happy if I bend over now. Since I met you for the first time, I had a lot of funny, funny comments, and then I got the very funny vibe from every single one of you. And you feel this awkwardness is natural already. So that's how you feel and how you have to manage on the stage. And well done, I'm so proud of you. Thank okay, you. and good luck on the, on the final show. I think you're gonna be great with this concept. Being able to do that today, to actually paint, while snaked, it was pretty challenging. And you know, I think there's a lot of similarities between doing that and actually doing what we're gonna do, do at the end of this week. But I had a good chat with Glenn today about actually what is my direction and which way I should be going and do what, what actually feels right to me rather than trying to sort of mold myself into actually thinking what I think I should be. And that there today, I think, I think I was the first one to take my kid off and get in there and actually give it a go. It was good shits and giggles. It was really just like, <laughs> Wait, seriously, that was just like, Oh, man, that was just hilarious, seriously. Next time on Is This Thing On? With the group instantly bonded, thanks to their nude painting adventure with Mayumi, everyone is a lot more comfortable performing in front of each other. I'm going to give you an affliction or a circumstance or an affectation. In an effort to free up their physical inhibitions, Glenn sets the class an improvised singing task with some outrageous results. Up above the world, so I'm fucking nailing a twinkle little star. <laughs> While Steve Van Apron takes Steve and Judy out into the streets of Paran to tackle the art of busking. And guest comedian Elliot Goblet, aka Jack Levi, addresses hecklers and has an inventive way of practicing how to deal with them. At least you didn't mention the elephant in the room. Oh, it just made me laugh. It's good fun. Thanks. <laughs> Woo! Oh, go on. <laughs>